r slash no sleep posted by you slash and Lewis. the police arrested my parents and i am freaking out part one have you ever heard a rumor about yourself that finally made its way back to you after years of circulation and you realize that everyone bought into it and accepted it 100 as a fact even though you know it's a complete lie that's what happened to me but way worse people aren't just saying that i sucked a dick or whatever they're saying that i'm somebody else and you know what I'm not even sure they're wrong anymore. Maybe I'm somebody else. One morning a few weeks back, I was in the kitchen eating my Cheerios, screwing around on my phone, and there was this loud knock on the front door. This is the police. I just about shit my pants, you know? I had a joint all rolled up in my backpack, on the stool right next to me. But I thought, there's no way they're coming to get me for a joint. That would be nuts. Open the door. Mom was up in the shower, and dad had already left for work. They kept on banging away at the door. I was scared as hell, but I didn't see that I had much choice. I got up and peeked through the side window there by the door and sure enough, it was the cops. Four of them. Four cops, banging away at the door. I took a deep breath and opened it. "Calvin Dunlop?" said one of the cops, a big massive dude that looked like he could crush me with one hand. The hand that was resting on his gun holster. "Step outside. You're okay now." "Is Lois Brown inside?" "Uh." Mom's up taking a shower. And I'm not Kevin Dumlap. I'm Nick. Brown. Lois is my mom. This threw the big guy for a loop. He turned and looked at his buddies. Then a lady cop spoke up. She looked nice. Not nice enough for me to trust her, but nice. I don't know what they did to you, Calvin, but you're safe now, she said. Come with me. Your parents are waiting at the station. I started to get a little dizzy then. Dad's at work. Mom's in the shower. What is this? Why are you guys here? I heard one of the guys in the back mutter. Jesus, he said. He thinks there is parents. Big guy cleared his throat. Step outside, son. We need to get in there and apprehend Lois Brown. It was a struggle to think at all, but I thought back to all those cop shows and movies and what not. You guys got a warrant? One of the guys from the back thrust his hand forward, and there was a piece of paper there. I didn't know what the hell it said, but I figured it was a warrant. I stepped outside. She's upstairs, I said. She's probably, you know, naked, so be careful. Lady cop took me gently by the arm and walked me down the steps into one of the cop cars. I turned my head and saw the rest of them go in the house. "Am I in trouble?" I asked. "You're safe now, Calvin," she said. I wondered who the hell Calvin was and why the hell they kept calling me that. Why the hell they were arresting mom. "Get in," said the cop, holding the back door open. Then, just like in the movies, watch your head. What was I supposed to do? I got in and we drove off. You're not hurt or anything, right? She asked. Nah, I said. Just, you know, confused. When we get to the station, you can see your parents briefly. But then we have a lot of questions for you. I'm sorry. I'm sure it's very painful and scary for you, but we have to get your version of events. She was right that it was scary. We got to the station and they're standing by the front door were two people, a man and a woman. They were crying. I'd never seen them before in my life. The lady cop opened up my door and said, "It's all right. You can go to them." I stood up, but I didn't go to them. They came running over to me, and both of them wrapped me in this wicked bear hug. Calvin, they kept saying over and over again, sobbing. I guess they thought I was this Calvin character too. But I wasn't. I was Nick. It was hard to breathe in that hug, but I finally choked out some words. Who are you guys? They pulled away and looked at me in a sort of shock. It's mom, said the man, and dad. He gave the cop a questioning look. He, er, seems to be confused at the moment, she said. That's why it's imperative that we get him inside and keep the investigation rolling. We'll have him back as soon as we can, Mr. and Mrs. Dunlop. She took my arm again and we started walking down the pathway to the front door. Wait. cried this Mr. Dunlop. Just one second. He dug in his back pocket and pulled out a wallet. He opened it up and held it out to me, stepping forward. Look, Calvin, that's us. Behind a little shield of plastic, there was a picture of this guy with a little kid sitting on his lap. The kid was maybe, I don't know, 5 years old. Sure, he maybe looked a little like I did at that age, but the picture was small, and it didn't blow me away or anything. And the intense look in this stranger's face was starting to creep me out. Oh, yeah, I said. Cool. Well, I better be getting inside now, 
right officer? We were in that room for hours. It was hell. I cried, I puked, I pulled a clump of my hair out. They asked if my parents, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, they called them, ever hurt me. No, of course not. They asked if I remembered anything about the day of the kidnapping. What the hell are you guys talking about? What kidnapping? They asked if I ever tried to contact anybody for help. Help from what? On and on. They were convinced that I was this kid, Calvin Dunlop. But I wasn't. Look, I said, at the end of my rope. You guys screwed up, big time. Can I just go home now? Or school? Or anywhere but here? Do you want to see your parents for a minute? Asked the detective, some dude with a ridiculous mustache. Yes, I said, feeling relief for the first time that day. Wait, no. I want to see mom and dad, my real mom and dad, not those two freaks that hugged me before. Mustache sighed. Those are your real parents, Calvin. Look, hold on. He turned to the mirror. I knew, again from the cop shows, that it was a trick mirror. Jerry, bring my laptop in here, yeah? A few minutes later, this Jerry guy came in with the laptop and set it in front of Mustache. Mustache screwed around for a bit, then flipped the computer around so I could see it. Take a look, he said. Scroll through those pictures. There were hundreds of them. Me as a baby, me as a toddler, me as a little kid, and so on. I recognized some of the pictures. My parents had shown them to me at various times. Some of them were even printed out and hanging on our walls. But others? Well, there were a lot of them with where I was with those people who had hugged me. The people claiming to be Calvin's parents. The people claiming that I was Calvin. That's when I puked. I'll tell you what they told me. Ten years ago, when I was five years old, Lois and Andrew Brown kidnapped me. Nobody knows why or how. They moved us all from Florida to a little town in Maine. They had birth certificates and all that shit. A social security card. So they moved us to Maine, enrolled me in school, got jobs, all that. And meanwhile, my real parents were going out of their minds, calling the FBI, stapling posters to telephone poles. Apparently I was even on a milk carton at one point. They'd just woken up one morning, and I was gone. The thing is, I don't remember it that way. I hardly remember anything from when I was that age, but I definitely don't remember Mr. and Mrs. Dunlop. I remember my parents, Lois and Andrew Brown. Vague globs of memory, sure, but I do remember them. I do remember that we lived in Florida and then moved to Maine. The cops can't explain any of that. They say I must have been brainwashed. They didn't use that word, but it's what they meant. But I don't think you can just go in and change somebody's memories. And it's more than memories. It's a feeling. I'm living with them now, Mr. and Mrs. Dunlop, back in Florida. I begged them, somebody, anybody, to let me stay in Maine, where my friends are. Hell, I'm almost done with high school, and now I have to haul off and start over again? I haven't seen. The Browns. The people that I still feel are my real parents, since that morning this all started. Like I say, it's a feeling more than anything. Something is off with the Dunlops. Most of the time, they don't do shit. They just sit there, staring at me, not saying anything. They make me sit at the dinner table and eat dinner with them, but they don't say anything. They just chew in silence. Then one of them will randomly come out with something over the top, how was your day-to-day -day son? Just like, way over enthusiastic, you know? And I'll say something like, well, it was terrible, I'm really scared, and I don't know what's going on. And they'll say, isn't that something? And go back to eating in silence. I don't know. Maybe they got screwed up by the whole thing, but it just doesn't feel right. Lois and Andrew. They could be assholes, but they felt like my parents. Now they're locked up somewhere. I don't even know where. Another thing that's really messing with my head is that there's no media coverage of this. Not in Maine, not in Florida, not anywhere. I mean, I'm not trying to come off as important here, but you'd think you'd hear something about this, right? It's a crazy fucking story, right? I asked the Dunlops about this, and they said they went through a media circus when I went missing, and didn't want to go through one again. So maybe it's not weird after all, maybe I've seen too many movies where the story always gets out to the press. But it sure seems like I should have seen something. Like, what about my friends back in Maine? Wouldn't they be talking about this? Speaking of my friends, I haven't been able to talk to them since this horror show kicked into gear. They all unfriended me, and they're not answering texts. Corey's the only one I ever heard back from, after sending him like a thousand texts. He wrote back, I'm not supposed to talk to you Calvin and after what you did, I don't want to talk to you Calvin. What? After what I did? 
I sent another million texts to Corey after that. What did you hear? I don't think you heard the real story. Come on man, tell me who told you what, etc. So that's where I'm at. I'm freaked right the hell out. I don't know what's real. I don't know what I want to be real, as if I had a choice. I don't know what I can do. I'm not even sure who I am. If anybody has any ideas that would help me sort this out, please, I am begging you, tell me what to do. The police arrested my parents and I am freaking out, update part 2. Hey guys, I can't, thank you enough for the response to my last post. I've been so lost and lonely that all of those helpful and supportive comments gave me a real lift. Plus my head's been a mess, so it's been really hard for me to think about what to do next, and I missed some obvious stuff that you guys suggested like a DNA test to sort out who my real parents are. That's where I decided to start, with the DNA test. The problem was that I didn't have my license yet, let alone a car. I didn't even have a bike. So getting around was a problem. But not the worst one. The worst one was that I didn't have a single penny to my name. To either of my names. I was pretty much at the mercy of my parents, Cheryl and Abel Dunlop, at least until I figured out how to get started on some of the more complicated stuff you guys brought up. The morning after my last post, I decided that I would confront them directly. Cheryl was in the kitchen, cooking pancakes. When she saw me come in, she busted out this crazy smile. It looked like it would actually hurt to smile that hard. Good morning my son. She almost shouted. I made you pancakes. Hey. Mom. I have to ask you something. Anything. Well, I'm honestly really weirded out by this whole thing. I mean, I don't remember you. At all. Isn't that something, she cried out between that creepy smile. You don't remember your own mother. Yeah. It is. So I was thinking. It's nothing personal, but. Can we get a DNA test? Two, you know, just confirm that you're really my mom, and Abel's my real dad. It would make me feel a lot better. That smile dropped in a second, and her face went pale. Calvin, she said, now in this voice that was pretty much a whisper. You saw the photographs of us, together. I'm your mother. You don't need to do a DNA test. My stomach pulled in on itself. This woman obviously wasn't my mother. If she was, she wouldn't have a problem with the DNA test. I wanted to run out the damn door. But where would I go? I took a deep breath, gripping the back of a chair. Well, it's just. You said that there was a lot of media coverage from when I was kidnapped. But I looked online and there's nothing. So. I mean, I'm sure you're my mom, it's just. I just want to get the test and then I'll feel better. Then that smile was back. Oh, is that all? A lot has changed in 10 years, son. We used to have four local newspapers. Two of those papers folded for good. The other two were bought out by a conglomerate. The online archives must have got lost in the shuffle, that's all. Oh, that's all? I thought. Awful convenient. Well, that's why I want the DNA test. Just as some proof that you really are my mom. I mean, it's pretty easy to Photoshop. I don't know if those pictures of us are real or not. You didn't let me finish, son, said Cheryl, almost screaming now. We have a box full of clippings and videotapes of the segments that aired on the news. That's part of the evidence we presented to the police. You don't think they'd just let us take you without solid evidence that we're your parents, do you? Oh, I said, relaxing just the tiniest bit. Can I see it? Of course, said Cheryl. Will you eat first, before the pancakes get cold? Nah, I said. Not really hungry. Can I just look at the articles and stuff? Of course. Now she did shout. Abel. Will you bring the box? Of course, shouted Abel from the other room. A few endless minutes later, he walked in and dropped a box on the kitchen table. Why are we dragging out this old stuff? He isn't sure that we're his parents, said Cheryl, letting out this weird, fake laugh. He doesn't remember that he was kidnapped. Isn't that something, said Abel. He doesn't remember his own kidnapping. I opened the box and started digging through it. Sure enough, there I was, five years old, on the front page of a newspaper. Five-year-old boy missing, the headline said. Then below the picture, Calvin Dunlop disappeared from his home yesterday morning. There were about a dozen or so articles in there, from different papers, covering the kidnapping. There were also a few old video cassettes. Can we watch these? I said, holding one up. Of course, said Abel. He took the videotape and we went into the living room, where he popped it into a DVD-slash-VHS combo player. He fast-forwarded through the weather and a few commercials, and then there I was again, this time on the TV screen. My mind was mush. Why didn't I remember any of this? 
That was me, right? It didn't make any sense. Then, slowly, a thought formed, maybe it was just somebody who looked like me. A lot like me, sure. Eerily like me. But maybe it wasn't me after all. I looked at Abel. Okay, I said. I believe that your son was kidnapped, and I'm really sorry about that. But. Sorry. I think I do need the DNA test. Now Abel's face went pale, like Cheryl's had before. A, DNA test? I don't think that's necessary, Calvin. We're, ah. We're a little cash strapped right now too, I'm afraid, after all of that travel and time off work. Why don't you just give it a few days? Your memory will start coming back, I'm sure. I don't know what those monsters did to you. But you'll remember. I'm sure of it. Then he started crying. Good show, but no way in hell this man was my father. Sure, I said, doing the best to choke down the fear in my voice. The crazy thing is that after that, I did start to remember stuff. No, the really crazy thing is what I remembered. Not about the Dunlops. About the Browns, and my friend, Corey. Abel drove me to school that morning. We were stone silent. I pulled out my phone and tried texting Corey for the billionth time. Come on dude, please respond. I don't think the Dunlops are my real parents. I'm fucking scared. What are you doing, son? Asked Abel, as I typed away. Just texting an old friend, I said. I miss him, you know. Really sucks. You'll meet new friends. I didn't want to. I wanted my old friends back. I started to get really pissed. At the Dunlops, at the cops, at everybody involved in this shit show. At Corey. Why wouldn't he talk to me? Why was he so quick to cut me off? Why did he believe? Whatever it was that somebody was telling him. He had been my best friend, practically since we met. And that's when the memory came to me, in a flash. We were in Maine, at the gravel pit, where we had parties by a big bonfire. Only we weren't drinking beers and shooting the shit as teenagers. We were little kids. It was a long time ago. The fire was there, climbing up into the dark night. Corey's face was covered with something. Blood? Was he hurt? No. He dipped into a bucket and pulled out fingers wet with a dark liquid. He smeared them across my forehead. What? I don't remember that. What the hell was that? I know that seems like a weird way to put it, but it's exactly how I felt. Like I was remembering something that I didn't remember. How's that for a mindfuck? The Browns were there in the memory, too, Lois and Andrew. They were. Wearing long dark robes? And chanting. They were chanting something I couldn't make out. What the fuck? I said out loud, the memory disappearing away as quickly as it had arrived. What's that son? Said Abel, pulling into the school parking lot. Oh. Nothing. Just had a weird thought. My phone buzzed. I looked in shock to see that it was a message from Corey. Finally. But when I looked at it, I got creeped out in about seven different ways, especially after that crazy flash of memory. It read, they're not your real parents. Don't listen to their lies. Come home, Nick. To your real family. I had a miserable time at school, as you might imagine. Finally, the bell rang and Abel was out there waiting for me. I got in the car and he handed me a piece of paper. What's that? I asked. The DNA test, said Abel in a soft voice. He seemed like an actual human being now. We had it done in Maine. We had to. It was the only way they would release you to us. We never wanted to. We vowed we never would, that I would be your real father no matter what. And. Son, this has been so hard for us. We haven't seen you in 10 years. We don't know what to do, how to act. We were going to wait until things got to something resembling normalcy before we told you. But I can see that you need to know now. So here it is. I looked at the paper. It said that I was a genetic match to Cheryl Dunlop, but not Abel Dunlop. Neither of the Browns were a match. Wait, I said, even more confused than ever. So you're not really my dad? But Cheryl's my mom? Abel took a deep breath and let it out. 16 years ago, we. I wasn't the only man in your mother's life. When she got pregnant with you, she told me everything, and we made the choice together. That we would have you, and I would be your father. Then he started sobbing. And I am goddammit. No matter what that piece of paper says. No matter what those. Monsters did. I looked at the paper again. It could be a fake. I do vaguely remember somebody sticking a Q-tip in my mouth when I was at the police station, but it's all such a blur of horror and confusion. And. I don't know why, exactly, maybe I'm dumb, but I believed him. I patted Abel on the shoulder. It's okay. Dad. When we got home, 
I headed to my room to process everything. On the way there, I passed by the ancient TV they had in the living room. And I got hit with another memory. I was sitting in front of that TV, as a little kid, watching cartoons alone. But then I felt something behind me. Four people were standing there, staring at me. One of them put his finger to his lips, shushing me, and I was too scared even to cry out. I knew his face. It was Corey's father. Andrew Brown was there too. He bent over me and put something over my mouth and then the memory ends. I stood frozen in front of the TV when my phone buzzed. It was another message from Corey. Don't believe their lies, it read. Help is coming. We're bringing you back home. I think that the Dunlops are telling the truth. I think that Cheryl is my biological mother, and Abel is my father by right. I think that the Browns kidnapped me, and Corey's family was involved. After an afternoon and night locking myself in my room trying to work it out, that's what I think. Beyond that, I don't have a clue. Corey's message, and those memories of him and his father, are seriously freaking me out. He's been my best friend for 10 years. What the hell is going on? I saw, in the comments for my last post, that some of you know a lot about how memory works. Is there anything I can do to help remember more? I think that would help me figure out what happened, and what's happening now. Or if not, are there any ideas about what I should do next? I think I'm going to tell the Dunlops about the memories and the messages from Corey. I think that's safe. But you guys were so helpful last time, I know I can trust you. So before I do anything else, I want to hear your advice. The police arrested my parents and I am freaking out, third post. Part 3. Hey guys, I'm typing this on the old desktop in Able Study. There's a big dude sleeping on the couch. I really hope he doesn't wake up. I don't know what would happen to me if the Dunlops knew I was posting about all this, but I don't want to find out. So, once again, thank you for reading and responding to my last post. It seemed like the advice was more mixed this time, and I guess that's because my situation has been so balls crazy that it's hard to know what to do. It hasn't gotten any less crazy since my last post. It's gotten crazier. Some of you suggested that I just go ahead and tell the Dunlops about the freaky flashbacks I had about the weird ritual, where Corey smeared me with something like blood when we were little kids, and the one where I remembered my kidnapping, involving Andrew Brown, and Corey's dad. And about the message from Corey saying that help was on its way. Others suggested that I keep my mouth shut until I find somebody neutral that I can trust. Well, yesterday morning I went ahead and laid it all out for the Dunlops. I mean, between the articles about somebody getting kidnapped who looked exactly like me, and my own memory of it, plus the DNA test which was probably real, I figured their side of the story was legit. And I felt that I had to do something fast, given Corey's text about help coming. When I was done telling them about it all, I half expected them to say, well isn't that something? And then cook me up some pancakes or whatever, but they didn't. As I told the story, their smiles kept dropping and dropping until they were gone completely. Your friend's father, said Abel, giving me this intense stare. The one who helped kidnap you. What is his name? Uh. Jack. Jack Calloway, I said. And what does Jack Calloway look like? Asked Cheryl, also shooting me an eerie stare. Uh. I don't know. Tall. Big beer belly. Going bald. Does he have a scar? On his face? Like this? Abel drew his finger across his face, next to his eye. Right where Corey's dad had a scar. Holy shit, I said. You guys know him? Abel and Cheryl looked at each other with wide eyes. They looked scared. Then Cheryl nodded, and Abel pulled his phone out of his pocket. Are you calling the police? I asked, relieved that somebody was finally taking charge. Abel totally ignored me and dialed a number. My house, he said into the phone. They're coming. Then he hung up. What? That, uh, was that the police? Do you know a cop or something? How did they know what you were talking about? What's going on? Dad? Your phone, said Cheryl. It's not safe for you to have it. Hand it over, son. My brain started screaming at me that something was very wrong. Hand over my phone? Why? Now's not the time to explain, son, said Abel. You're in great danger. We all are. Hand the phone to your mother. I was a mess by then, just raw nerves and scared out of my mind. But I wasn't going to give up my phone. No, I said. I need it. Abel stood up and took a step toward me. I stood up and took a step toward the door. He grabbed my shoulder hard and I felt it. It felt like he could crush me if he wanted to. And that he might just want to. I started to feel sick and dizzy. Your phone, son, he said, holding out the hand that wasn't digging into me. There was nothing I could do. 
I pulled the phone out of my pocket. Tears started to well up, but as I was handing my phone over, I saw that I had missed a text from Corey. Good boy, said Abel, releasing his grip on my shoulder. You're a fucking asshole, I said. You're not my dad. Abel flicked my phone open and read the message. They're close, he said to Cheryl. Get some tea ready. Then he turned to me. You. Go to your room and stay there. I understand that you're upset. This is not because you talked back to your father. It's for your own safety. I wanted to make a run for it, out the front door. But what would I do after that? No wheels, no cash. No phone. And something told me that the Dunlops wouldn't let me just get away. There was a gas station about a mile down the road, but there was no way I could make it. Not without wheels. I tried to think where they kept the keys to their cars. I had no idea. I was trapped. Fuck you, I said. Then I headed up to my room, flopped on my bed, and started crying like a baby. It was the tea that Cheryl was making. I could smell it all the way down the hall and through my bedroom door. It had a weird, strong smell. In my last post, some of you mentioned that smells are the strongest triggers of memory. You were right. As soon as I smelled that god-awful tea, I was hit with one hell of a memory. I was a little kid. It was before I had been kidnapped. There were a bunch of people in our house. I was supposed to be in my room, but I wasn't. I was peeking through the door of the study. That's where everybody was. They all had this. Patch sewn on their white shirts. I couldn't make out the symbol, but they were all wearing it. My father was there. I don't mean Abel Dunlop. I mean my real father. I don't know how I know it was my father, but I know. I don't remember anything else about him, but I know that it was my father there, sitting on the couch next to Cheryl. She was handing him a cup of tea. Abel was there too. So was Corey's dad. About eight other people. My father took a sip of tea. Then he keeled over. I cried out, and everybody whipped their heads around and saw me peeking in. Then I was running, and that's all I remembered. Back in the nightmare present, I heard people starting to come into the house. I was staring up at the ceiling, trying to shake off the shock of the memory. I couldn't quite put it together. My real father. They did something to him. Something was in that tea, and Cheryl, my mother, I was now sure, made him drink it. And those patches. It seemed like some kind of secret society or cult or something crazy like that. My father had been a part of it. And my mother, and Abel, and Corey's dad. It was too much. It was way too much. It was already too much even before that. It was more than too much now. The window, I thought. Climb out the window and just run like hell. I got out of bed and looked out the window. I could see the front door from there. Two dudes were standing on either side of it with big guns resting against their shoulders. Cars were pulling into the driveway. As the people got closer, I recognized some of them, but not all. They all had that patch sewn on their shirts. One woman looked over and saw me. A huge, terrible smile spread out across her face, and she waved at me. She had been there, in my memory. I slammed the curtains closed and curled up in a ball on my bed. Finally, I got up and put my ear to the door, trying to hear what was going on. I was way too scared to actually open the door. I couldn't hear much, just people talking, and I couldn't make out what they were saying. I went back to bed and just stayed there, all night, trying to piece it together. The Browns, now in jail, kidnapped me with Corey's dad's help. They were part of that crew in Maine, that seemed to be a cult or something, wearing long robes and smearing me with shit and chanting. But before I was kidnapped, there was another weird crew. These guys maybe killed my real dad, and the Dunlops were obviously deep in it. Corey's dad was a part of that crew too. These guys wore patches with some kind of symbol sewn on a white shirt. Now the robes were apparently coming down to try to get me from the patches. At least that was my best guess. Why were they fighting over me, and who were they really? I didn't know. I didn't have the foggiest idea. I just wanted it to be over. And I felt, in my gut, that it would be over, soon, somehow. And that didn't exactly make me feel much better. People started leaving the house just as the sun was coming up. I watched them all go. Even the Dunlops left. But there were still a few cars in the driveway, and when I looked over, sure enough, there were still two people standing by the front door with rifles. Different people, like they'd changed shifts or whatever. I was exhausted, but also wired up, you know? I finally got up the balls to creep into the Dunlop's bedroom and look for my phone. I couldn't find it. I thought about looking around some more, to see what I could dig up, but then I remembered that there was a computer in the study. That's when I headed in here and found that dude snoring away on the couch. The first thing I did was find the local police website and send off an email. 
I haven't heard back yet though, so I don't even know if anybody got it, let alone if they believe it, or if help's coming. Then I started writing this update, while I wait for a response. I don't know if there's much you guys can do for me at this point, but maybe you have some ideas? I don't know when or even if I can log back on to check your comments. But I'm pretty desperate at this point, so I thought I'd give it a shot. I think that something terrible is about to happen. Oh shit. I just heard a car pull in the driveway, and I hear people talking outside. I gotta go, guys. The police arrested my parents and I am freaking out, final update. I want to thank you guys for being there with me during this nightmare. For most of it, you were all I had. The only ones I could trust. I really should be lying low right now, but I wanted to make this last post, because I know a lot of you have been wondering what the hell was going and have been worried about me. I had to cut off my last post because I heard someone coming into the Dunlop house. I didn't want to get caught at the computer, so I ran back to my bedroom. I locked the door, hopped in bed, and pulled the covers over my head. I heard footsteps getting closer, and then they were right outside my door. Somebody knocked. Calvin Dunlop? This is the police. Are you in there? We got your email. Thank God. I got up and unlocked the door. As I was opening it, I wondered why there wasn't more commotion with the guards at the front door if the cops were here now. But it was too late. He shoved the door the rest of the way open and stepped in. Isn't that something, said the cop, with that same awful smile that all of these guys had plastered on their faces. Calvin Dunlop. In the flesh. Well I'll be. That's it, I thought. I turned and was getting ready to just smash through the window and make a run for it. There were still armed guards out there by the door, but there was an armed and crazy cop in here with me. At least out there was some open space and I'd have a shot. Not much of a shot, sure. But something. The cop grabbed me by the arm. Then I wasn't going anywhere. Please, I said, too exhausted to sob. Just tell me what this is about before you kill me. We're protecting you, Calvin, said the cop, still smiling. The smile didn't fit with the big meaty hand gripping my arm. And I didn't feel protected from anything. Protecting me from what? I groaned. I am so honored that mother and father have selected me to enlighten you. He shoved me down onto the bed. The bad people have brainwashed you, Calvin. You have forgotten your purpose. You have forgotten that in 17 days, the world is going to burn. You have forgotten that you are the vessel that will carry us to safety. When he said that last bit, he pointed up at the ceiling. The room began to spin as I tried to form a thought. There was something about 17 days. Who are the bad people, and why do they want me? I asked. I figured that was a good place to start. The cop opened his mouth, but the sound of a gunshot coming from outside cut him off. I just about pissed myself, you know? Terror on top of fear on top of horror. A nice shit sandwich if ever there was one. Isn't that something, said the cop. They're here. You're safe with me, Calvin. I obviously didn't feel very safe with him, especially not after he whipped out his gun. Another gunshot. I tried to look out the window, but couldn't see very well from the bed. Then the gunshots really started popping, one after the other, like a war was going on out there. In between the loud bangs, I heard tires screeching and people shouting. God damn it. A month ago, my biggest problem was making sure I didn't wake up my parents while I was in bed jerking off. But then it turned out those weren't my parents at all, and now I was. Here. The fighting was getting closer to the house, and before long, I heard the front door banging open, and then there were people inside. The cop cocked his gun and pointed it at my bedroom door, ready to blast away whoever tried to get in. I got up as quietly as I could and crept over to the window. This was my shot. But when I looked out, I saw that there were four people there, crouched down, right in front of my window, guarding it. They were wearing dark robes. Fuck. I heard people screaming. I heard people groaning in pain. Sometimes I would hear this really gross and horrifying splattering sound, like something wet was hitting something hard. I heard a ton of gunshots. Then the door to my room was flying open, and the cops started shooting at it. I ducked down and covered my ears. A second later, a body thumped down right next to where I was crouched. It was the cop. He had a freaking arrow sticking up out of his forehead. His dead eyes were staring up at the ceiling. His smile was gone. My ears were ringing like hell, but I heard it. Nick. Calvin. Listen to me. You have to come with us right now. Then I saw an arrow fly from the doorway to the window, shattering it. I looked up, and there was Corey's dad, Jack, standing there with a crossbow in his hand, dressed in one of those dark robes. What is happening? I shouted. Jump out the window, said Jack. You're safe now, if you hurry. 
Not until you tell me what this is about, I said. Look, these people. They're a cult. The Dunlops. Your mother. I was a part of it too once. The Starlighters, they're called. Calvin, the day you turn 16, they are going to kill you. I would turn 16 in 17 days. Jesus. And who are you guys? We rescue people from cults and give them their lives back, said Jack. I will explain everything later. Right now, we have to go. Corey's dad never got a chance to explain anything more than that. I heard the gun go off, felt the splatter of blood, and then he was down, right on top of the cop. I couldn't help it. I puked right on his dead body. Standing there in the doorframe was Abel Dunlop, holding a big gun. He walked slowly over to the window, and let off four quick shots, killing the robes who were out there. Isn't that something, said Abel. Old Thomas the troublemaker. That's his real name, you know. Not Jack. Thomas. He lied to you, son. Abel reached down a bloody hand to me. I slapped it away. You killed my father, I said, and you're going to kill me. Not at all son. I am going to protect you. From them. If they get a hold of you. It's too terrible to think. In 17 days. You're going to kill me. Lies, said Abel. In 17 days, we are all going to be free. We are going to the stars. It's the ones left behind who will be in trouble. A second later, Abel's severed head was on the ground, his tongue sticking out of his mouth. A half a second after that, his body hit the ground too. I blinked hard and looked up. What now? My father was standing there. My real father. The one from the memory I had where the starlighters forced him to drink poison tea. He was holding a bloody samurai sword. Dad? Let's go, kiddo, he said. He reached out his hand and I took it. He yanked me to my feet. Jump out that window and run. He pulled a gun out from behind his back. I'll cover you, but I think it's pretty clear by now. The gunfire had definitely died down a lot. There's a jeep backed in by the garage. If I don't make it, just drive, son. Find Corey. He'll tell you everything. I don't know why, exactly, but I 100% trusted this guy that I only had a single memory of. This guy coming to me in the middle of the craziest shit that you can imagine. I got up and jumped out the window. The front yard was covered with dead bodies. Some of them weren't quite dead. I ran by one guy who was stretching his arm out to me. He had a patch sewn to a shirt that used to be white, but was now red. That patch had a bunch of stars on it. I'll see you. In the stars Calvin, he gasped at me as I ran past. It will really be something. My dad and I made it out of there, in his jeep. I'm going to summarize what he told me, because I kept losing focus and interrupting him to ask questions. Corey has filled in some of these details too, over the phone. When I was a kid, my parents were nerds. My dad came up with this idea to start the Starlighters Club, where they'd come up with these elaborate scenarios and act them out. Like they were the last defenders of the universe against some evil aliens that were going to come and torch the place. It was just for fun. You know, like LARP. Corey's dad was part of the club. Then Abel Dunlop joined the gang, and things took an intense turn. He got a little too into it, and soon the whole group did, including my mother. She kept dropping character less and less, and then she stopped altogether. She really started believing this shit. Everybody did. Then Abel started talking about the Great Merge. That really just meant killing me when I turned 16. As soon as he heard that, my dad went to the cops. But it turned out that a few of them had heard about the Starlighters and wanted to join. So they weren't any help. My dad called everybody together. He was still their captain. He was going to tell them all to cut it out and find another hobby. But Abel knew that. He had Cheryl spike my dad's tea. Nothing lethal. In fact, the plan was to keep him alive long enough to kill him right alongside me. That would give the whole thing some extra juice, apparently. Corey's dad volunteered to keep my dad in his basement. On the drive over, my dad woke up and dug his fingernails into Jack's, or Thomas, I guess, face. That's where the scar came from. But Jack had the needle ready to go and knock my dad out again. It took a year of living in his basement, but my dad finally convinced Corey's dad that the whole Starlighters thing was batshit insane. I mean, my dad started the thing, so he was good at explaining the mechanics of it. Corey's dad started researching cults online, even as he kept my dad in the basement, because he wasn't sure at that point, and came across a couple that had made it out alive from a particularly nasty cult. The Browns, they were calling themselves now. So Corey's dad got together with them, and they decided to start their own thing. Called New Beginning. The idea was to rescue people from cults, whenever that was possible. Especially children. 
starting with me. They let my dad go, but didn't tell him their plan. They figured that it was too iffy to release me to my dad. After all, he started the thing. So they kidnapped me, on their own, and brought me to Maine. They had studied the brainwashing techniques that were used on them, and were able to convince me that I was really the brown son. They declared a new beginning for me at a bonfire, with a bucket of home-brewed wine, wearing robes as a nod to the Eastern religions that had helped them cope with their own transitions back to normal life. Corey's dad was not really Corey's dad. He was also a rescue case, from a cult in Oregon. New beginning grew fast, across the country. At first it was people who had managed to escape cults themselves. Then it kept growing, as they rescued more and more adults. Adults had a choice to join the group or just move on. Kids who were too young to fend for themselves, and had no other safe options, were adopted and brainwashed into a new family. Meanwhile, the Starlighters were growing too, and offshoots were forming. That's how they finally found me. I'm pretty famous in the cult world. I guess there's a place on the dark web where they all get together, and my picture has been circulating for years. Somebody from my town in Maine recognized me. They alerted the Dunlops privately, and meanwhile had their kids spread all of these rumors about me. That I had killed my real father, and that I was sending my adopted parents to jail. That I was crazy and dangerous. And because they were masters of manipulating people, everybody at school started to believe the rumors. Corey did it first, too. But before he left for Florida, Corey's dad told Corey everything that I'm telling you now. Corey was supposed to keep totally quiet about it until I was safe, but he couldn't help but send a few texts letting me know that help was on the way. Meanwhile, my dad had been looking for me this whole time. He discovered that dark web group and followed it for years. When he saw that they had found me, he flew straight to Maine. But by the time the dark web group was talking about it in their chat room, it was already over. I was back in Florida with the Dunlops. So he turned right around and headed back to the airport, and that's where he ran into Corey's dad. At first, my dad was ready to kill Corey's dad, right there in the airport. After all, the guy had kidnapped me without my dad's knowledge. So my dad kind of had a point. But he decided that rescuing me was more important than vengeance, and he knew he couldn't do it alone. So they teamed up, along with a network of new beginningers, and organized an attack on the Starlighters. It's nuts, but that's what was going on the whole time. Like I said, it took me hours and hours of going over the same thing again and again before I finally could sort it out. But that's what happened. My dad and New Beginning got together and saved me from the Starlighters. As you can imagine, I'm pretty screwed up after all of this. It's not really over. I don't think it will ever be over. My mother might still be out there. All of the offshoots of the Starlighters are still out there. How many? I don't know, but I know it goes deep, and we have to be careful about our next move. I'm on my way to see Corey right now. I can't say where. After that, we're going to try to get the Browns out of prison. But man, from what I've been hearing, you've got people at the federal level involved in this shit. Not many, but enough that you have to be really careful. So I'm signing off now, guys. Don't worry about me. I've got my dad, and I'll be with my best friend pretty soon. For a minute there, you guys were my only friends. I'll never forget that. And if I ever hear about any of you guys smelling some weird tea. Well, I'll be there for you.